You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, delicious friends, and welcome back to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, with me, your host, Katie Charlewood, history harlot and reader of books. Welcome back, everybody. It is the first episode of the new year. And I know we're like halfway through January. And you did get like Dick Turpin technically as a delayed sort of thing. But I've not been well. And then I was away in Munich in Germany for work. So that was fun. So I've kind of been all over the place a little bit. And I just got back last night, actually. At 10 p.m. was when I finally got home. And so today, I was like, no, I'm, I had my notes done for days, actually, because I was prepared for this. And I was like, I need to be ready to go so that when I get home, I can just, like, set up the computer, set up the microphone, and just get back to doing what we do best. Talking about people from history who have been misrepresented generally through the eyes of the pale and stale males. Thus, as we know, just poisoning our perception of, you know, cool people. I mean, sometimes, you know, people do dodgy shit and that's fine. But we support women's rights and we support women's wrongs. And you know me, I don't believe in slut shaming, I believe in slut faming, and that is why we are talking about who we're talking about today, because I thought, let's start the year as we mean to go on. Not late, because that's not great, but like, the other stuff. So news before we get into anything else. I have a live show coming up in Dublin on the 3rd of February, Saturday, 3rd of February, 2024, and it is the bank holiday weekend and of course we are celebrating the day just like Bridget would want us to. Talking about salacious women from history while wearing a dress that shows just a little bit too much cleavage and that is just how we do it because again I am your favourite history harlot and I think the first like so many tickets because I did a January sale are like only a tenner and the rest are 15 so like you should totally come see me at Hysteria Shanae in Dublin it's super fun. Um, I did my uh, gig there before and I had somebody message like, hey, where else in Europe are you going to be? And I'm like, I don't know. It's January and I literally organized this like, I think just after Christmas or just after New Year's. I was like, hey, I'll come do a show. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, cool. <laughs> so I haven't got anything else organized yet. But if you're in Europe and you want me to do a live show, I'm just saying, let me know. <laughs> I'll come. Well, I, I mean, we'll see if you're cool and not like an arsehole. But yeah, it's been, it's been a time of it because I was sick. I had pneumonia, as many of you who follow the socials will know. And yeah, it, it's been like straight from one thing into work. And then I'm still not like tip top, but it's fine. Then I had to go to Germany and then I went to Munich, but then saw like none of Munich. So that was fun. But I did eat many, many pretzels. There was a pudding pretzel. That was the term. Pudding pretzel. Who knew that was a thing? Like a dessert pretzel. It was delicious though. I had like a custard situation going on. Fucking amazing. I absolutely loved it. And then um, at breakfast, there was salami in the shape of pretzels. I mean, when I tell you, I had my fill of pretzels and I bloody love pretzels. These were just... The perfect German experience for you know, a little tourist like me. I say tourist if I wasn't working, but like, you know what I mean? It was super fun. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your jibber jabber and fact me. And fact you, I will. But first, we've got to get our source on. Our sources are Queen of Hearts, Marguerite of Valois, by Charlotte Haldane, The Rival Queens, Catherine de Medici, her daughter Marguerite de Valois, and the betrayal that ignited a kingdom by Nancy Goldstone. 
The Myth of Rain Margot by Robert J. Seeley. The French Wars of Religion, 1559-1598, by Robert J. Necht. Marguerite de Valois, La Reine Margot, by Eliane Vignot. The Memoirs of Marguerite de Valois, by Marguerite de Valois. And of course, we have our favourites, History.com, History Extra, and Biography.com. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then let's begin. So here is a woman I've wanted to talk about for like a long time, but I try not to stay within the Renaissance or like post-Renaissance like too much because, you know, there's so much other history out there that's just wild and fascinating and wonderful. But this period in history, those sort of 1400s, 1500s, they are wild. Like, it, it's clear that Europe is ruled by a bunch of teenagers for like a long time. Like, you, it's, it's, it's just as you would imagine it would be. Like, let's put teenagers on the, on the throne. Let's see how it goes. Um, spoiler alert, um, not well, but fascinating history nonetheless. But yes, all this stuff is happening um, for like quite a long time. And then, just one thing after another, and this story has everything. Assassinations, weird names. I mean, some really weird names. Not just like, oh, they're Ford. No, 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 no. Some of these names are ridiculous, and I will apologise for my pronunciation. Um, my mouth isn't great at the minute, but it, we'll work it through. But yeah, uh, it's got so much intrigue, desire, passion weird religious stuff so much going on family just oh dynamics oh my goodness it's it's a lot happening and it all revolves around one marguerite de valois now this is gonna shock you um, but we actually have a date of birth a woman from the past with a date of birth a date and everything not just like I don't know, maybe July. No, an actual date. Because Marguerite de Valois was born on the 14th of May, 1553, at the Chateau de Saint-Marie-en-Laye. She was the seventh child and third daughter of Henry II of France and Catherine de' Medici, who is absolutely going to be, like, having an episode. Might even have to split it into two. I don't know yet because she... She left a life, and I'm not even going to cover much of Catherine here. Like, it's going to be, like, tip bits, if anything, which will show you just, just how much she just... Again, women's wrongs. So much. She did so much. But, yeah, Marguerite, um, I'm actually going to call her Margot for the majority of this episode because that's what she was known as during her lifetime, and I'm trying to get into the habit of doing this more, especially when I'm finding this out. Because I don't know if you've listened to my Gronya Wheel, Gronya O'Malley episode, and my issue with the fact that her name is Gronya or Grania, depending on your pronunciation. But her name that she used during her lifetime should be the name that she is known by. Because that's her fucking name. And that's why I'm working very hard to ensure that I do say the right name for everybody and so Margot was what she was called and that's what she called herself so we'll just do that and Margot you know what bollocks it we are gonna do it in chronological order because I don't know Brady Bunch it I guess is the best way to do it so we have in order of appearance the children of Henry II of France and Catherine de Medici Francis the Second, Elizabeth, Queen of Spain, Claude, Duchess of Lorraine, Charles the Ninth of France, Henry the Third of France, Margaret, Queen of France, and Francis, Duke of Anjou. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of kids here. Again, there's there's a bunch of them. But how to put this? Royal families are weird at the best of times. But um, let's face it. King Henry was more into his mistress than anything else than Catherine de' Medici. Well, 
Royal Court was a power play after power play. Sneaking, schemes, a flying squad. Catherine de' Medici had a collection of maid servants, so on and so forth, uh, ladies in waiting even, who were part of sort of this flying squad of hers. They were a spy ring, specifically under sort of the rule of Catherine de' Medici. And so she had them like all over court, just using them to find information and, you know, just uh, help her out. You know what I mean? But back to Margot. So childhood starts at the Royal Nursery and she spends time with her older sisters, Elizabeth and Claude. Now, Elizabeth and Claude, they're much older than she is. So when they get betrothed and get ready to get married, you know, they go off. And she is sent to Chateau de Saint-Germain-en-Laye and Chateau d'Amboise. Again, I apologise for my pronunciation. And so she spends her time there with her brothers then. And growing up, she has a favourite brother, Henry. And so they grow up like pretty close. And it's Charles the Ninth actually who gives her her nickname because he starts calling her Margot. Could he pronounce Marguerite? Were there just a fuck ton of Marguerites and he just couldn't be bothered? Perhaps, but that is uh, that is where they're at now. When Margot is six years old, tragedy strikes and she has to witness, well, a horrific accident resulting in what I can only assume will be a lifetime of trauma. So when she's six years old. Her father, King Henry II, dies. There is a jousting accident. He takes a lance to the eye. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a lance. It's like a long pole. You should go watch A Knight's Tale. It's very fun. But yeah, effectively, he gets a lance to the eye. A splinter goes in. A chunk of the lance goes through his eye into his brain. And it's a pretty horrific and unpleasant death, which is witnessed by all of the children, or at least all of the children that are still at court. So it is it is not a pleasant death. And at this point, her oldest brother, Francis I, takes the throne. Now, Francis I, you may remember, um, was the weak and sickly sort of ruler who was married to Mary, Queen of Scots. Like they were married, I don't know, not that long and he dies of an ear infection because a lot of these kids they're pretty they're pretty sickly um and because when she's about seven that's when he dies so like a year after he dies of an ear infection and the next brother <laughs> heir and a spare that charles the ninth becomes king and he's only 10 like he's this is a kid king so naturally he's ruling but Catherine de' Medici is the one pulling the strings. Like, that's... We know that's happening. But all this stuff is is going on. And, well, she is a princess. They have plans for her because, as we know, princesses are really good for anything other than alliances and building bonds and being used as a pawn to, you know, strengthen yourself and promote your own country and make money. And, you know, when wars and all that kind of other shit. You know, how does it work for you? So she needs to be educated well. And so she learns sort of grammar, history, classics, a lot of Bible stuff. So, like, she really knows Holy Scripture. Because remember, France, very Catholic. Very Catholic country. You know, really into Jesus. And so they learn a lot of, like, religious stuff. And she's very competent in prose, poetry, dance, you know, the things you're supposed to have at court, these skills. And she also has pretty good horsemanship. Because of course she does, because, you know, skills. And yeah, so again about the whole religious thing, French court is sort of a yin and yang situation. Because it's super Catholic and everyone is acting all pious. So it's like very straight laced at the front, but party in the back. 
So behind closed doors, it's wall-to-wall smut. There's sex, debauchery, the liaisons dangereux, you know, shit's going down. The Catholics, I don't know if you've ever, ever met a Catholic. Um, if you haven't, they are absolutely filthy. Like, like there's this joke about Catholic schoolgirls. It's all the, you know, repression and, I don't know, the tartan uniforms, I assume. But, like, there's all this repression and it just kind of comes out in hormones. And majority of the court, you know, they're not that old. So there's there's a lot going on. But, yeah. Most Christians are kind of dodgy in fairness, but Catholics are absolute horn dogs. Um, so yeah, as she's grown up in court, you know, she she's kind of aware of everything. They don't hide a lot from the kids because they didn't know to do that. Because, you know, it's the past. Um, but she does a lot of stuff. She goes on a grand tour with her family. They sort of, for two years, they travel around France to just kind of promote the king and the royal family and just you know try and try and show themselves off build alliances you know so on so forth and because of all this sort of um, issues that were happening in France there's you know religious segregation as it happens you know I mean this is Quite a tempestuous time, I must say. But Margot, she kind of learns sort of political mediation from her mother, Catherine de' Medici. Like, she pays attention. She learns shit. And as she's getting older, you know, she is female and of royal blood. And as such, they they need to find her a husband. And so... They start these marriage negotiations um, with, like, Carlos, Prince of Asturias, Sebastian of Portugal, um, Archduke Rudolf. Like, they're, they're trying to make these things happen, but they're, they're not really landing anywhere. Things aren't going well. Now, growing up in royal court, so she would have spent time with, you know, all of, like, her siblings, but also... People like Mary Queen of Scots and Henry of Navarre. So it's not like a royal nursery per se, but a lot of royals, they would send um, a person, a child, to go stay with like other royals, other nobility, and they would be raised by them effectively. And this would like build sort of relationships and strengthen bonds. Um, unfortunately, Henry of Navarre, his mother, Jean, she ain't happy he's there. Um, instead of seeing him like a ward of the royal family, uh, she sees it, uh, effectively, as kidnapping. Kind of like Theon in Game of Thrones, like when he's taken by the Starks. I don't know if you've watched Game of Thrones, but the Greyjoys, his family, basically see it as a kidnapping. They see it as like stealing like the last male heir. And Henry of Navarre, he is, he is, like, the male heir of Navarre. And so, yeah, like, they're keeping a hold of him to make sure he doesn't start any shit. Or his family doesn't start any shit. There, there's just kind of issues there because Henry's family are, how do I put this, um, they're, they're Huguenots, they're protestants effectively and again very catholic country and there's these protestant sort of pockets happening there's slight uprisings and it's not greatly appreciated by the royals as such and so by keeping him there it kind of puts pressure on those sort of the protestant side now growing up in court in Rey of navarre he's not like the hottest guy like he's fine but he's not you know cool and I think as well if you grow up with someone they're less attractive to you because it's like having a brother like Mary Queen of Scots would have been like a sister to her because she was trained to be like a French princess as we have discussed before 
but Enri, he's just, he's not, he's not that fun or interesting or smart as far as any of the documents say. Like, I can't find anything that great about him. It just seems to be more convenient that he's there. And also, how many times do I have to say this? Your family tree should not be a wreath. Now, I don't know how close so much that the French royal family are, but clearly something's going wrong there because the majority of sort of Henry II and Catherine de Medici's children were like sick and frail and just unwell in general and none of them were any great beauty until Margot shows up because she apparently was an absolute stunner. Um, her older siblings, eh, they're fine, I guess. I mean, we know that uh, Francis the Francis the First, he was very sort of sickly and weak, and he was short because I know that um, Mary Queen of Scots, like she was pretty tall anyway, like she was very tall for the era. But yeah, they weren't. They weren't anything, you know, to shout home about. But you had dignitaries and foreign delegates who would write back home about how fucking gorgeous she was. Um, she was so beautiful, she was referred to as the Pearl of Valois. Like, she had a great sense of style, she wasn't sick like her siblings, so she wasn't outwardly ill, she wasn't noticeably sick. And she was just beautiful, and she was fashionable. And she was, you know, the it girl of Valois. Like, I have to share this quote with you because it's just, <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, the beauty of the princess is more divine than human. She is made to ruin men rather than to save them. Now, I don't, I don't want to be um, pernickety here, but I am going to be absolutely pernickety here. But this is basically calling her just a slut, effectively. Because she's flirty. Because, you know, courtly games of love are very much of this period. And so because she's flirty, and because she is gorgeous, and because she's just, just effervescent, she's just wanted and desired. And she plays on it a little. And naturally, you know, clearly... Men do not like that. Uh, I'm not saying times have changed. But yeah. So when Margot's a little bit older, um, when they're about 14, 15, because there's not much age difference between Henry of Navarre and Margot. There's like a couple months, I think. So when he's about 14, 15, Jeanne, Henry of Navarre's mother, basically kidnaps him back and she swipes him back to the palace in Navarre. And naturally, Catherine de' Medici is pissed because she had been conned and Jeanne of Navarre had used Catherine de' Medici's money to abscond with Henri. Like, she had orchestrated it and she'd used Catherine's money to do it. And... Oh, if there's one person in the world you do not want to piss off in sort of medieval France or Middle Ages France, Catherine de' Medici, definitely one of them. Like, no, no, that's not a person you want to bother. <laughs> Absolutely not. Like, you're digging your own grave there. So, <laughs> during their teenage years anyway, so Enley has gone for a bit. And during Margot's teenage years, like, she's really close to her brother, Henry. So, I know there's so many, so many Henrys. So, I'm going to be like Henry and Henri because it's just easier. So, her brother, Henry, um, they're, like, really, really close. And it gets to the point that the, the Valois family, so this, I don't know. Uh, so, again, weird relationships. They are a sort of scheming and sneaky and there's a lot of like political backbiting and a complete lack of trust and obsession with power 
seems to be going on here. So her brother Henry, he basically gets Margot to get close to their mother, Catherine de Medici. Now Henry is, he's the favourite. He is the favourite child, he's the golden child and he's very close to his mum. But when he's away, he has Margot sort of become very close to Catherine. Like she is the first person in a room with her last person out. She is helping her, getting involved in planning. Because again, she's mainly ruling for Charles. Like she's quote unquote advising him because that's what Catherine de Medici does. She just puppet master in the corner. And when Henry, her brother, has to go away, he leaves Margot in charge of his affairs. And she rules and plans and does all this stuff for him. But unfortunately, when she is there in court, there is the gorgeous Henry of Guise. De Guise, I should say. Not the geese. Not the geese. Those are those are dangerous and evil and they will beak you in the face. And Navarre being gone she's unbetrothed, she's a free agent and there is this absolutely gorgeous, stunning, hot, sexy, older than her dude. And they kind of flirt and they do the usual stuff, kind of the courtly games of love they're joking about and, you know, they're flirtatious in nature because she's a teenager, you know, it's what she does. Hormones! And rumours start circling around court, especially because de Guise's family have been caught up in, you know, a sticky wicket or two. And there is this conspiracy that the Guise family are planning to kidnap King Charles IX. Um, so obviously that goes down like a lead balloon. And these rumours start spreading. And so Henry, he suspects a secret romance between Margot and de Guise. And there's rumours of, like, marriage plans. I, and there's all this, again, bullshit swirling around. But it's mainly just because they're hot young things and she's not an idiot and things are going well. So, uh, unfortunately for Henry, de Guise is very popular around court. He's just, you know, ladies' man, man's man, man about town. He is adored. And Henry doesn't fucking like that. So when he comes back and he hears these rumours and he sees what's going on, he is not very happy with Margot and this split happens. And again, when these rumours are going round, he basically um, creates this Lasting brotherly hatred between Margot and himself because when the family discover, I say discover, when he dobs her in and accuses this of happening, like de Guise being, you know, this older, like, teenage boy could have easily started saying that he did do, you know, that he deflowered the fucking king's daughter. Like, he could say he did that, but yeah, no didn't happen and it's just bullshit spread around court which was then fueled by Henry of Anjou, her brother, because he was a jealous fuck. So Marco had been getting close to her mother for four months and she had become the favourite child. She had been learning Catherine's ways. But after Henry of Anjou comes back all pissed off, Catherine is just done with this. She stops really communicating. She distances herself from her daughter and she just goes back to having Henry von Drew be her favourite. And all of this happens is because he snitched. He sets her up. He claims they were boinking and actively trying to wed, which she couldn't do anyway. Like Margot can't do that. That's not an option for her. Uh, she can't get married without the king's permission. So, like, Charles has to agree before she can do anything. 
she has no power in this. She has no choice. And she, growing up in that court, would be well fucking aware of that. And marrying without the royal permission? Yeah, that's... That's just fucking stupid. And Margot is not an idiot. But... Because Henry of Anjou was an absolute dickhead, this results in Margot being dragged out of her room and beaten at the request of the king. Because, again, these rumours then go back to Charles, who thinks that he has been publicly disgraced by his sister, that she was not following his rule. And these beatings keep happening. And it's absolutely shocking because here's the thing. In the 16th century, in order for these political considerations to happen, in order for these agreements and arrangements to work out, the princess, a princess of royal birth, a noble-blooded king's daughter, she has to remain a virgin up until her wedding night. That is the rule. Like, that's it. End of discussion. You cannot have your honour disgraced. You cannot have the king's honour disgraced. I mean, I know she's the king's sister at this point, but still, you can't do that shit. Like, her life would not be worth living. And again, we've said over and over again, like, the easiest thing to gain and the hardest thing to lose, especially as a woman, especially throughout history, is a reputation. And this is the start of it. This is the start of calling her a whore, right? This is the beginning point. All because her brother was jealous. All because of that. Because he couldn't handle that she was popular and she was friends with somebody who was popular. Like, there's zero evidence of them having any kind of physical relationship at all but yeah she is getting the shit kicked out of her but in order to nip this in the bud she goes to her older sister claude who has married into the de guise family and she begs and pleads her to convince henry de guise to marry someone, anyone, doesn't give a fuck who, like, anybody will do, pick one, because she needs these rumours to go to bed, excuse the pun, because, you know, she doesn't want to get beaten daily because she was polite to some cute dude at court, like, she doesn't want that happening, I know I wouldn't want that happening, and I think, as, you know, plans go, I think it's a fairly reasonable and acceptable one. Anywho, next thing you know, Henry de Guise gets married. Huzzah! Marco even attends the wedding. So clearly, no hard feelings there. Now, um, with this situation, yeah, yeah. Like, most people who grew up with trauma, it can lead you to being, you know, less than trusting with people you should be able to trust, like friends and family. And this entire situation taught Margot a lesson that would stay with her for life. Now, she's a teenager, she is of the right age, and as such, it's time to start marriage negotiations. So, Catherine de' Medici, she is trying to arrange a marriage between Margot and Enley of Navarre. You know, because he's a Huguenot. A Calvinist, a Protestant, a just, you know, any of those. He's one of those things, right? And she is trying to arrange a marriage between the two. Even though she fucking despises his mum, Jean. Unfortunately, uh, over the years, Catherine had alienated a fuck ton of people for, you know, being a strong world woman in power who definitely poisoned a few enemies along the way. But anyway, <laughs> there, there wasn't a lot of options left. And so there is this possibility that by marrying into, the, you know, one of the leading Protestant people, they could uh, stop some of this 
religious upheaval and, you know, war. Religious war throughout the country. Perhaps, possibly, you know. Oh, work it out, work it out. So, this union is aimed to strengthen sort of the family ties and end the French wars of religion between the Catholics and the Huguenots. And because, yeah, so France is basically in this civil war because of um, sectarianism, really? Yep, sectarianism. They're fighting because one of them believes in Mary, the other one doesn't. One likes statues, one doesn't want statues. Where do you keep the toaster? And, you know, it's it's weird, It, but it's a thing. Do you believe in the same God? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool, guys, yeah. It's such an odd one, but anyway, yeah, they are... There's They're trying to, like, put a plaster over a gaping wound, you know, with this sort of marriage. So, um, on the 11th of April, 1572, Margot is betrothed to Henry, and they're both, like, 19 at this point. And, you know, it's expected that this is going to be, like, a popular union because of who's who. But, you know, again, the Catholic-Protestant divide, which, I know, this may shock you, uh, caused some unrest. You know, a little bit of a uh, controversy. And people were well mad that they thought this union, effectively. And it was assumed that because Margot, being the woman in this scenario, would convert to her husband's religion, thus tainting the royal family, or something. But yeah, no. Uh, see, Margot is proper Catholic and she saw conversion as effectively setting herself up for eternal damnation. And she wasn't already super keen on marrying him, you know, one, for religious reasons and two, because he was boring as fuck. But, you know, it didn't matter anyway because she's a princess, um, she exists as a political pawn to make build and strengthens alliances and as such she has to do what she's told she has to marry him like that's the be all and end all the situation but what Catherine de Medici does is she forces Henri of Navarre to convert so he is forced to convert to Catholicism even though he's a Protestant like it's the situation But this happens, like, a little bit later on. I'm skipping ahead a wee bit. So, this is... It's a weird wedding at the best of times. Um, The service is unusual because Pope Gregory XIII, he refuses to provide a dispensation for the wedding. Um, Like, just straight up, he's like, no, I'm not allowing this to happen one way or the other. And it just gets weirder from here because... Henri of Navarre is not Catholic, he's not even allowed to step foot in the Notre Dame Cathedral, so before he converts. Uh, And what happens is, Henri of Anjou, you know, the brother that she fucking hates, has to stand in for him. Now, marriage by proxy is not unusual at the time, but having your brother stand in for your husband in a wedding ceremony it's no no it's it's weird okay it's weird and actually the mother of the groom is not the wedding uh because she's dead so they are engaged in like april and then in june jean henry of navarre's mother dies out shopping for a wedding outfit now the rumor is that because you know she had insulted catherine by stealing back her son and stealing Catherine's money to do it, that, you know, Catherine de' Medici held a fucking grudge and had her poisoned by way of gloves. So, of course, you know, you have to wear your gloves. They're, you know, part of your royal attire. So the theory goes that the gloves were lined with poison and when she tried them on, (gasps) dead. That's a theory anyway, so... She dies, and because she's already, like, engaged to him, 
Margot becomes Queen of Navarre when Jeanne dies. Now, in August, 18th of August, 1572, at the Notre Dame Cathedral, Margot and Henry of Navarre are married. And, um, now, this is going to shock you. There's propaganda again. <gasps> what? No, I know. You are surprised at this information. So, there's this whisper going round that Charles the Ninth forces this marriage, which... Honestly, load of bollocks. Because, you know, he wanted an alliance and it was safer for everybody for this to be in place. Like, it made sense. This was a reasonable, like, union to have. But there's this theory that he, like, forced her head down to nod, which didn't happen. It just didn't happen. But yeah, it's, um... Again, people are just mad about it because religious shit. And it almost becomes a red wedding situation. Too many Game of Thrones references in this, actually. So, the celebrations last for a couple of days. Because that's how, like, royal weddings work. Like, celebrations last for a period of time. And a lot of prominent Huguenots, they had come to Paris to celebrate this. Because, for them, this is a big step up. Because their Protestant king, or a Protestant king is marrying, you know, the Catholic princess of France. And so they're seeing this as a big win. And again, they're assuming Margot's going to convert. So there's this whole sort of idea happening. And a few days in, a few days after the marriage, there is the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And because, again, a lot of these high-ranking Huguenots were in Paris you know, for the wedding, for the celebrations, they're assassinated on the orders of one Catherine de' Medici. So Catherine orders the assassination of this high-ranking Protestant general and frames the Huguenots. She frames the Protestants. But the plot thickens. Because how she does this is she also makes it seem like the Huguenots, the Protestants, were trying to frame her. So it's this sort of sticky, twisted, just knot of of web. It just it's complicated. It's just in case anything does come back to her, she's made it look as if they're framing her. I mean, it's I mean it's a smart plan and it worked like it did work now margot was actually sitting with a bunch of these high-ranking protestants like she was spending time with them when this assassination occurred so she knew a bunch of them weren't involved so because she was with so many of them during uh the time where the attack occurred she she knew they weren't part of this and she actually has the only eyewitness account of the family like she writes in her memoirs about this happening and so when the massacre happens when you know this uproar because the protestants did this thing and you know they're blaming you know the queen catherine de medici you know they must be stopped and you know when there's sort of religious tension when there's sectarianism in any sort of society they just are waiting for a spark to ignite the explosion. You know what I mean? They are ready to cause chaos. And that's what happens here. Um, but Margot, she is in her beds one night. Uh, I think it's the day of sort of the massacre. And this huge note comes stumbling into her room, which, first of all, big no-no, you do not enter, you know, queen slash princess's room uninvited, especially random man. No, that is a big no-no. And being the defiant queen that she is, she like leaps out of bed, kind of blurry-eyed, sees what's going on, sees this wounded dude whom, as far as we can tell, doesn't know or doesn't know that well and sees that he's being chased by, like, palace guards and archers and all this shit. 
And being the defiant bitch that she is, she jumps between him and the guards. And she's like, don't you fucking touch him. Not a chance. And so she basically saves his life and she tends to his wounds. And it gets to the point where she is bringing Huguenots into her rooms, her areas in the castle, because the guards can't cross her. They can't step in and fuck this up. You can't, you know, do anything to the king's sister. And so she saves just like a bunch of lives. Because, you know, she doesn't want a mass murder like on her doorstep. And she doesn't want involvement in it. But she feels that she's partly to blame for it. Like, again, because she's grown up with trauma. Like, and she's doing her best to just, um, well, protect these guys. And the St. Bartholomew's Massacre, because it happens on St. Bartholomew's Day, for the record, it is huge. Like, it starts in Paris, but then it spreads all over France. It is, you know, from the main city out to the countryside. And depending on the numbers, like, it's so fuzzy. Like, there's no definite sort of information. Like, from low to high, the guesstimations are between 5,000 and 30,000 Protestants are killed. And this, this fucks things up for them, really, because it tips the scales. Um... There are so many prominent players assassinated that the Huguenot cause is just bollocked up. And not only do you have like these main political figures just wiped out, you have this mass reconversion happening. So people are reconverting from Protestantism, Calvinism, Huguenots, whatever. They are converting back to Catholicism, you know, to save their skins, if nothing else. Even though conversion for a lot of people, like I said before, it's selling your soul. It's eternal damnation. You're going to burn in hell. Like, that's what they think they've signed up for now. Because they're just trying to survive. And this is again where Henry of Navarre this is where he converts, because Catherine de Medici's like, you know, you want to survive, you're going to convert. So he does. But then she goes to Margot and she proposes an annulment of the marriage. You know, oh, look at this civil unrest, all of these issues. You know, it's almost as if she had planned this in advance in order to remove, you know, detractors and issues. You know, enemies. Possibly. Who could say? Me. I'm saying it. She was involved. And knowing what's happened and feeling the way she's feeling, Margot says, fuck this for a game of soldiers. She's going to protect her husband because, as far as she's concerned, they have wed under the eyes of God. And so she has a duty. She's, again, proper Catholic, well religious. And so in order to save her husband's life, because... She feels, again, responsible for the mass murder of all of these people. That she tells her mother that they cannot annul the marriage because, you know, she is his wife in every way. Now, chances are, as far as we can tell from, you know, all of the history, they hadn't consummated the marriage yet. But she had told her mother that to basically, you know put him under her protection but what's kind of sad and and and, and is that Henry of Navarre never knew she did this like throughout their time together I I mean I feel like it could have helped things later on if we had that information but nah so anyway but yeah Margot she says she shagged Henry of Navarre to save his life I mean it's not the worst lie one could make up in life Now, with Henry of Navarre converting and effectively saved by Margot, he becomes an ally to the French crown. And he is sent away to trash rebellions and whatnot, leaving the 19-year-old Queen Margot at home at court. And so she creates the Muses of Paris. 
So she has a bunch of high class ladies just being fabulous and stylish and congregating with great thinkers and artists of the day. And they're just, again, they're bright young things. They're having a fabulous time. And she is establishing salons and legit living her best life. Having the time of her life, even. Mm, time of her life. And yet, well, you know, Henry's away. Margot will play. And she meets at one of her soirees, Joseph de Boniface who was in his late 30s, um, another ladies' man, man's man, man about town. Um, and he woos her, by which I mean he's pushing 40 and she's a fucking teenager. I don't care who you are, it's creepy as fuck. I don't care what era you're in, it's creepy as fuck. Like, I don't care. It, ew. I will say it, ew. I realise I went very valley girl there, I uh, don't know where that came from, but it's happened, Naomi, you'll have to accept it. So he is a pal of her wee brother Francis. And you're thinking, Francis, her brother? Isn't he dead? Well, okay, so young Francis here is originally Hercule or Hercules. I'm not entirely sure which it is, but um, I'm going to go with Hercule. And he changes his name to Francis for reasons. But anyway, they're friends and... um. Possibly lovers. And she starts up, I mean, I don't want to call it an affair because, you know, it's a creepy older man with a teenage girl and I, I, it just feels weird. It feels weird. But yeah, stuff happens there. Anyway, and when Margot is 20, King Charles IX, his health is deteriorating is probably the best way to go uh because his mental state is not great and he gets very very sick and during this time in order to keep um henry of anjou you know not being an arsehole he gets elected um king of poland because henry of anjou he is uh very rigid very strict in his particular belief system and he's dealing with these uprisings in Poland because you know he has a thing for suppressing Protestant worship doing what he does best you know be an absolute dick he is crushing it all over the shop and this leads to a plot by sort of uh, the malcontent who are these moderate Catholic lords and they have this plan to put Francois of Alençon on the French throne, so younger brother Francis, because they're like, yeah, we can't be dealing with Charles, because he's like, mentally like, fading away. And Henry over there, he's just being himself, an absolute piece of shit. And so they're like, yeah. And and Francois of Alençon, he is a bit more chill, he's a bit more lenient when it comes to sort of religious differences and his willingness to compromise in religious matters makes him like a really good option because a lot of people are just tired of bloodshed like they're sick of violence and they want it to stop you know and he seems like a really good deal so yeah Francois and Henri of Navarre and the Catholics the moderate Catholics the reasonable Catholics People who are sick of fighting and the Protestants are arranging, orchestrating, planning a coup d'etat. They're planning a coup to usurp the throne, to put Francis on the throne and get rid of Henry III. And of course, Margot is about to stick her oar in and get involved. Now... It's, this episode's been going on a little bit longer than I expected. This is going to end up being a two-parter because I was not expecting to talk this much. My goodness, I had a lot of notes. I'm sorry. And there's just so much. It's so much. I could easily talk about Queen Margot for like another eight or nine episodes. I could easily do it, but I'm not going to do that because there's other people I want to talk about. But I am going to finish this episode here and we will start with a coup next time. I really wasn't expecting us to get through this so quickly. 
but here we are. Yay, yikes, wow. Okay, so uh, you can follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Uh, and did I say Instagram? Threads? Is it Twitter now? Whatever Twitter is now. Uh, come see my live show. It'll be great to see you. And recommendations. Oh my goodness. I am going to suggest that you read Lessons in Chemistry. Did I recommend that before? Maybe I did. Either way, read it. It's good fun. I say good fun. It's a bit intense in places, but it's it's a good read. Uh, for listening, no more Christmas music. I think we're done with it. But you know what I've been listening to a lot of recently is I started listening to the Midnight's album by Taylor Swift again. I was just in the mid for it, you know? You should definitely do that. And for watching... Ooh, decisions, decisions. Oh. See, I haven't seen Echo yet, but I hear it's amazing. I hear it's amazing. Oh, that feels ableist. It does, doesn't it? You know, but um, from what I have been told, it's meant to be an amazing show. So I'd say definitely give that a go. And yeah, that is the end of today's episode. And I am going to bid you farewell. And I will chat to you next time. I really wasn't expecting this to be a two-parter. I really wasn't. I was really hoping this was just going to be one, but then I realised just how much I was talking for. And I would like to formally apologise for that. Um, I think as well, I'm not quite speaking properly. I'm not quite there yet. It's, again, just the issues are back, but it's fine. And we will get through this together. But, adios, au revoir, à vous, my friends. Bye-bye.